In college, there was a guy on our floor named Steve, who was studying evolutionary psych, and was constantly conducting different psychological tricks and experiments on us. They were all pretty cool and challenged us to think outside the boundaries of our minds. One night, he came back with a mirror game. It was similar to other dares and challenges involving mirrors like Bloody Mary or Candyman. Only in this case, the villain that showed up in the reflection was you. Kind of. The game involved perception, namely your perception of yourself. From there, it expanded outwardly, encompassing other people and places and their relations to you. All you needed was yourself, a mirror, in complete concentration. I had a mirror, but it was a long week and all I wanted to do was sleep, so I stayed in. A floor-wide email was sent out inviting everyone to try it in their rooms. The game was called the Gemma Vu Challenge. Gemma Vu is a French phrase and translates to being the literal opposite of déjà vu. Whereas the latter, déjà vu, translate to already seen, Gemma Vu translates to never seen. In a psychological sense, it relates to the phenomenon of experiencing a situation that should be familiar, but is instead foreign and unrecognizable. Seeing things or people that you should know, but for some reason, they appear as strangers or unknowns. Everyone has experienced some form of this in their life. An easy example would be if you've ever been looking for something in your home. After minutes of searching, you finally locate it in a place you know you checked multiple times. But for some reason, it blended into the surroundings and its familiarity made it invisible. Or temporarily unknown. The Jemais Vu challenge was grounded in this idea. The challenge played with our own perception of who we are, and had very simple directions. You had to be alone in front of a mirror, and you had to keep it close to your face. Then, you have to stare into your own eyes and say your name repeatedly. The name repetition and eye contact with your reflection allowed you to accelerate the familiarity you had with your name and face. The object was to say your name so many times the word no longer made sense to you, while at the same time concentrating on your face so diligently you no longer recognize it. I wouldn't recommend it, but if you're brave enough you can try it. You'll be surprised with how quickly your name means nothing, and your face becomes a stranger's. How the sounds and syllables turn alien in your eyes, nose, and lips morph into an outsider's. The challenge, if done correctly, made you forget who you were. So in a sense, it shaved you down to your most basic human instincts. It reminded me of a story I once heard from a drama teacher. She had a student who was quiet and reserved, and had a hard time breaking out of her shell. The teacher convinced her to do a heavy scene that involved a loud scream at the end. The student played the part well, but couldn't manage the scream in the finale. The teacher pushed the student and kept at her, trying to pull out something deeper. Then she did. The student began to scream, a horrific guttural shriek, and she wouldn't stop. She just kept going. The teacher tried to calm her down. The other students tried as well, but it was like a switch had been flipped deep inside the student, and some electrical bolt of emotional fear charged through her. The screams were terrifying. They were animalistic. They sounded far down the evolutionary rabbit hole. The student found something. Somewhere inside of her that was so unsettling it made several other students throw up. An ambulance eventually arrived and the student was taken away. Even as she was driven off, you could hear her screaming. The teacher never saw or heard of the girl again, which was annoying because I wanted to know more. 
I always pictured the student in some asylum, probably sedated, her vocal cords numbed down, but still trying to scream, the switch inside of her somehow still stuck in the on position. My roommate Allie told me she was joining the challenge and was doing it next door. I had zero interest in that and fell asleep on the couch. A storm hit that night. I woke up just before midnight from knocks at the door between claps of thunder. The knocks were uneven and strange, and the door was unlocked. I opened it to find Allie. She was frazzled and nervously trembling as she looked in at me. I warmingly reached out to wave her in, but she pulled back. Allie looked at me like I was someone she didn't recognize or know or trust. She looked back down the hall, which I realized had smoke gathering in the air. I peeked out and saw the smoke coming from a room down the hall. I heard movements and struggling sounds coming from the rooms. Everything felt off. I reached forward again, warmingly, and this time Allie was receptive. I put my arm around her and guided her in. She became like a baby under my arm, infant-like, as if needing protection. I tried to talk to Allie, but she wasn't speaking right. Her words were coming out in long, strangely connected mumbles. They sounded backwards and upside down, like a stroke having a stroke. I brought Allie to the bathroom and closed the door to give her privacy. She behaved like she didn't want me to leave her, but was unable to speak the words. It was all so bizarre. I felt like I was still sleeping. I panicked, wondering if I should call the RA or go straight to calling an ambulance. Then I heard a scream. It was from somewhere on our floor, further down the hall near the rec room. Then the fire alarm went off and another, and another. But just as soon as they did, I heard three loud individual cracks, and the ringing shorted out. I tried calling Steve. I could hear his cell phone ringing somewhere in the hallway. It continued ringing all the way into voicemail. No one answered. I tried again, but nothing. It kept ringing until it stopped. I waited a few minutes until the hallway had been quiet long enough. Then I grabbed a pen-sized can of pepper spray and quietly opened the door and peeked out. It reeked of burnt toast. The hall was filled with smoke now and I could barely see the next door. I crept along the wall passing the closed doors of other students' rooms. Behind some of the doors there were sounds unintelligible mumbles and cries. My plan was to get to Marie's room. She was our RA, and her room was at the far end of the hallway near the kitchen area. I continued along the hall and passed through the rec room. The TV was on, and an old episode of Jeopardy was playing. Lachlan, one of the guys on our floor, was sitting in front of the TV, staring mindlessly and mumbling the same way as Allie. He made me uneasy, and he wasn't acting like the normal guy I would watch shotgun beers in the bathroom stalls. I backed up, deciding to go back to my room and try calling Mary instead. I turned back to the hallway and the cloud of smoke. There was a crying sound coming from deep within it. Between the sobs, there were jumbles and backwards words. That same stroke-like cadence. It was a sad, disturbing crying that made me want to run back to my room and bolt the door. The silhouette got closer and turned into Laura, another student. Laura's room was down the hall near the staircase. She was stumbling towards me, her hands cupped out in front of her. She was trying to speak, but crying through it. Laura tripped, falling forwards, her hands out pleading for some kind of sustenance. I didn't know what to do, so I backed up, and just as I did, a new shadow appeared. It was Steve, and he'd lost his mind. Steve was swinging one of his baseball bats, 
which was covered in blood. He, himself, was also covered in blood and his clothes were ripped and shredded. His eyes were wild and he was screaming violent jumbles of words. Steve didn't see me, but he saw Laura. He grunted at her and swung the bat viciously. The bat connected with the side of Laura's head, sending her sprawling into a room. Steve followed her in, swinging the bat like he was playing whack-a-mole. Laura's screams and cries drowned out and were replaced by the slapping thud of Steve's bat against flesh and bone. I rushed across the doorway and tried to make it down the hall, but Steve heard me and chased me down. Steve got a hold of me two doors down from my own. He had one arm around me and was trying to pull me to the ground. I got a hand free and pulled out my pepper spray. I struggled and fought and managed to press it right into one of his eyes while I was shooting it. Steve screamed and let go of me. I shoved him back and ran through the smoke. I got inside my room and locked the door. He never came to the room, but I heard him crying and hitting the walls as he patrolled the hall. I got a knife from my mini kitchen and went to check on Allie. I found her huddled up in the far end of the bathtub. She reached out to me like a child would its mother. I spent the next hour holding her and rocking her to sleep. Campus and state police arrived and cleared all the rooms. They found us in the bathtub, Allie was still spouting gibberish. But I could speak and told them what I knew. As we were escorted out of our room and down the hall, I saw numerous body bags in rooms and the kitchen. I knew Laura had died, but it didn't hit me until then how much larger this all was. In the end, it turned out that Steve had killed seven students and the RA Marie. Allie eventually recovered, regaining her memory of self and others. Steve was sent to an asylum. He's very lucid and normal now as well, but he has a strange animal quality to his eyes. Like everything he looks at is prey. Most people would be terrified if they looked in the mirror and what they saw back wasn't their face, but their character. And it's made me wonder what mine would have looked like if I'd done the Jemavu challenge. If I would have been like Steve and fallen into a deep evolutionary well that supercharged my limbic system, if the lizard tail in my amygdala would have brought me back to infancy or turned me into something dangerous, I'll never know.